Okay, um, Sanjeev, just request you to also unmute yourself. Thank you. And um, hello, everyone. I think we've crossed the thousand participant mark. We're about 1100. Um, and I think many people joining in fast, rapid. Uh, uh, obviously, it's a serious conversation. And I think many of you are going to draw a lot of uh, insight into this. Um, Sanjeev Mehta needs no introduction. Uh, overall, uh, he's been heading Hindustan Unilever since 2003 for the last seven years, but of course has been a Levers person for the longest period of time. When I was growing up, Levers was this one entity where you felt they had mapped rural India and urban India in terms of distribution, knowledge, and consumer understanding better than the Indian government. I think today that holds, holds even more true, just with the depth at which they penetrate. 18,000 employees is what uh, Levers has. And I thought, therefore, it would be just appropriate for Sanjeev to share with us some of the thoughts of what's going on wrong with many of you all working professionals and young people today. Um, I've known Sanjeev for a fair period of time. Almost every time that I've met him, he's been able to talk on a completely diverse topic. One day he's talking about real estate and the impact of that. The next time he's talking about rural India and how that merges with urban distribution products and everything else. Um, I saw him as a peacetime leader and a wartime leader, and therefore I requested him to address all of us today. So, Sanjeev, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thanks, Ronnie, for inviting me. And I'm absolutely delighted to speak to all the audience. And before I start sharing my thoughts, I just want to wish and hope that all of you, your dear ones, are safe. Do take care of yourselves. And uh, what I've done today is, uh, of course, uppermost in everyone's mind would be COVID-19, its impact on the global economy, on India. And uh, so I thought I'll first share my thoughts on COVID-19, and then I'll get into about the work, jobs, and careers, because they are in many ways intertwined. So the question that will first come to your mind, how bad is the impact on the economy? And what are the scenarios for recovery and whether there will be any lasting structural impact from the crisis? Now, in reality, projections and indices won't answer this question. Hardly reliable in the calmest of time, GDP forecasts are dubious, especially when the virus trajectory is unknown, the effectiveness of containment efforts are unknown, and the consumers and the companies or the firms' reactions are unknown. The reality is there is no single number that credibly captures or foresees what the impact of the impact of COVID-19 could be on the economy. When you look at the brutal meltdown in the global financial markets, including, of course, our own BSE, NSE, it might seem to indicate that the world economy is on a path to recession. The recession risk is absolutely real, but let us not take it as a foregone conclusion. Second, while financial markets are a relevant recession indicator, history has often shown that bear markets do not necessarily lead to recessions. Now, the second question you might have is, what is going to be the impact in India? Of course, the lot will depend on to what extent can India contain the spread of the virus and bend the curve. The good news is that we have a large domestic economy and that dependence on exports is not very high. The risk, of course, is that economy was weakening even before the crisis and we could have comorbidity. India has to move the focus now from lives to lives and livelihoods. In fact, these are in many cases intertwined. The government should be applauded and they have done a decisive job in closing the borders and locking down the country. And now a similar kind of resolve should be shown to stop the economy from stalling. A big risk is breakdown in credit line, which could lead to severe liquidity crisis, high number of bankruptcies and severe job loss. Now, the question you may again have is, what is going to be the likely recovery path? Now, whether economies can avoid the recession or not, the path back to growth will depend on a lot many drivers. 
such as the degree to which the demand has been delayed or the degree to which the demand has been lost, whether the shock is truly a spike or it lasts, or whether there is a structural damage. Economists generally sketch them in three broad scenarios, a V, a U, or a L. In a V shape, the output is displaced, but the growth eventually rebounds. Though it may seem optimistic amid today's gloom, this is very plausible. In U shape, the shock persists, and while the initial growth path is resumed, there is some permanent damage from an output perspective. L shaped is ugly, causes significant structural damage, impacting the economy supply side, the labor market, capital formation, and the productivity function. At this stage, it is difficult to imagine the scenario, even with pessimistic assumptions. But this is not something we should rule out. And as a country, we need to prepare for it. Hope that it doesn't happen. Hope that it's a V and not an L. But we should definitely prepare for it. If you look at empirical data from the prior shocks, including the epidemics such as the SARS, the Hong Kong flu in 68, the Asian flu in 58, the Spanish flu in 18, they were more like V-shaped. Yeah. So there is still, and I'm a born optimist, I would still hope that in a country like India, God is kind and we are able to bounce back. It doesn't happen in a L-shaped recession, but it is more like a V. Now, how does the impact manifest itself? There are three plausible transmission channels. First is, it takes a knocking on the confidence, what I call as the wealth effect. Yeah, when you get a shock through the financial markets, your household wealth contracts, and then what the normal tendency is to start saving money, and that impacts the consumption. The second is, when there is a direct hit to consumer confidence. When financial market performance and consumer confidence correlate strongly, then the con consumer confidence drops sharply. And this could potentially have a direct hit on consumer spending, making them wary of discretionary spends, and perhaps becoming pessimistic about the longer term. The third angle is the supply side shock. Now, the difference between many other recessions or the financial crisis, like if we take the financial crisis, that was very simple compared to what's happening today. You take care of the global big financial institutions and the country's big financial institution, and you would be able to start overcoming the crisis. Here, we have a demand side problem, we have a supply side problem, and then it could also lead to severe financial problems. Now, as the virus shuts down production and disables critical components of supply chain, gaps start coming into being and they then turn into problems. Production could halt, layoffs could occur, and that is when you get into a vicious cycle. Now, it's also very important to understand that recessions are generally cyclical in nature and not structural. However, the boundary can be blurred. History also suggests that the global economy after a major crisis like COVID-19 will be different in a number of significant ways. First is, if you look at it from a lens of microeconomy, crisis can spur the adoption of new technologies and business models. The SARS outbreak in 2003 is often credit, credited with the adoption of online shopping among Chinese consumers which really resulted in Alibaba's rise. Yeah, this could have a similar impact in our own. As schools have closed in many parts of the world, could e-delivery of education see a smart breakthrough? Digital efforts in Wuhan to contain the crisis via smartphone trackers, it did demonstrate a powerful new public health tool. The other is when you look at it from a macroeconomic perspective. Even before the crisis, the world was moving away from globalization. Will this even give further impetus to anti-globalization forces? Then if you were to look at it from a political legacy perspective, the ramifications cannot be ruled out. 
Will it shape the U.S. elections? And also at a multilateral level, the crisis could be read as a call to more cooperation or conversely, the move to unilateralism. It will really depend on how our leaders act and react. So the question should be, what should leaders do in relation to economic risk? First, don't become dependent on projections. Financial markets are currently reflecting great uncertainty. A wide range of scenarios remain plausible and should be explored by every business. Second, don't allow your financial market turbulence to cloud your judgment. Third, focus on consumer confidence signals, trust your own instincts, and know how to leverage your business's data and calibrating insights. The impact is not going to be uniform. It won't be uniform across countries. It won't be uniform across industries. And the conclusion will have to be very specific to the kind of business you are in. Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Keep in mind that a V-shaped recovery is a plausible scenario, conceptually and empirically, but don't let that insight make you complacent. Start beginning to look beyond the crisis. What micro or macroeconomic or legacy will COVID-19 have? What are the opportunities or challenges that will arise that you can encash? Consider how you will address the post-crisis world. Can you be a part of a faster adoption of new technologies, new processes? Can you eventually find advantage in adversity for your company, for your clients and your society? And in every big crisis, it is, of course, a test of leadership. There are different kinds of traits which will have to be demonstrated. First and foremost, keep calm. Retain your confidence. Relentlessly communicate with your people. Yeah, make them comfortable. Actively collaborate with your partners, with the community. Reach out to the communities. Unless we step out and unless we can make a difference to the context, we won't be playing a part. Be compassionate. And very importantly, focus on cash. These are the times when you go away from margin percentages to start looking at cash. Liquidity and cash is going to be the determinant of who survives and who does not survive. Now, let us now start looking at the future of work, the jobs and career. At HUL, we moved to working from home from the 16th of March. In Unilever, work from home is not something which is new. new. We have been giving this option to people and many have adopted it in the past. But we have never practiced it at this scale with thousands of remote workers. Initially, I too was skeptical, but technology has enabled us to survive. And while working from remote, we have not only been doing our best to keep the supply lines of essentials running, but have also completed a multi-billion dollar merger with GSK Consumer Health. As we have settled down to new routines, it is also making us question a constant need to travel during normal times. It is also making us understand new ways of keeping virtual teams engaged and very importantly, accelerating the adoption of technology at work. Isn't this the new feature of work? The transformation of work and organizations is being shaped by technology and talent. Faster computing power, connected devices, cloud, blockchain, RPAs are redefining the man-machine interface. The other is the entry of the digital natives in the workplace. This is a generation who have grown up in a world that feels much flatter due to the way the technology connects people, allows for immediate responses and a whole new way of collaboration. The implication of this combination on jobs and careers are tremendous. McKinsey Global Institute estimates that 60 to 65 million jobs in a country it could be created through a productivity surge in the next few years. While at the same time, redeployment will be essential to help about 40 to 45 million workers whose jobs are likely to be displaced or transformed by technology. If I were to generalize a bit then, routine and monoskilled roles will be replaced with specialists, insights-driven and multidisciplinary roles. 
Skills like creativity, empathy, collaboration will gain even more prominence, as will the requirement for hardcore data scientists, design and system thinking talent. If I pick up a very simple example, the conventional job of a HUL salesperson will remain but he will be supported by technology which will enable him to customize assortment for each of the millions of stores in the country. But at the same time, the timeless skills of building and nurturing relationships with the customer, creativity at the point of purchase will also be required. Not only are jobs being transformed, but so is the way the work gets done more interdependent, more collaborative, more agile, and more flexible. The vectors on which the teams will evolve, in my opinion, will be first would be remote. And I think this COVID-19 technology is going to accelerate this. Technology liberates the need for teams to come together. And we have seen it. Every day in the morning, I start by my South Asia leadership team meeting. And I end the day at London time with the global Unilever executive board meetings. Yeah. I used to travel to London twice a month. Now I'm just about, we have complete, we are just about completing three weeks and we have been having more meetings as a Unilever Global Executive Board than we had before and all from remote. The second is gig. Teams will comprise of permanent, temporary, freelance and machine employees. And this diversity will call for an even greater need to build cohesion within the members. The third would be agile and organic. Teams will keep evolving based on the phase of the project, the value to be created, and the skills to be required at any phase of work. And fourth and very importantly, members could co-opt themselves to projects they are passionate about with teams being self-created rather than being curated by leaders. I'll give you a very, another very easy example. Last year, we launched a fabric detergent brand called Love & Care. It was a classic case of a team that pivoted on all of the above four vectors. We had innovation experts inputting from London and Shanghai, brand managers in Mumbai working on the concept, a freelancer working on the packaging design, and select members of the global fabric care team who had volunteered to be part of this exciting project. The entire project was completed without any addition of any manpower in the innovation team. Of course, this kind of environment will require several enablers. It will require technology. It will require high level of social skills to connect a virtual team. It will require flexible work policies that allow for people to choose work times that work for them and their role. And of course, leadership that is able to lead with influence and not authority solicit participation and not hierarchy, and is purpose-led and not power-driven. So how do you plan for careers in this era? First and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, take charge of your own career. The days of patriarchal organizations that made decisions on our behalf, on people's career, are long over. Second, careers do not view it solely from the lens of vertical progression. Look at adding diversity of experiences, acquiring new skills. Literacy will no longer be about learning to read and write, but it will be about learning, unlearning, and relearning. India needs great managers and great entrepreneurs. A fabulous case is our host today, Ronnie Screwwala. When we were young only, people with money could think of becoming only people with money could think of becoming entrepreneurs. Look at Ronnie. Yeah, with his ideas, with his passion and his determination, he's become a great entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. And today, even money is not a constraint. When you have a right idea, money does come in. However, there are many things which are timeless. Expertise, domain skills, leadership, intuition based on skills and experience, ambition and humility. Never, ever lose sight of them. Yeah, you will have, if you follow them, you will have a great career, whatever you choose to do. So, Rani, 20 minutes, that was the appointed time you gave me to speak. 
now we can open it up for questions. I have to say, when I, I've just been scanning the whole lot, we have uh, right now uh, about 1,725 people, 1,725 people who have been quite hooked and glued to what you've been talking about on a very diverse set of topics from what you've experienced at levers to jobs and careers to the macroeconomics. I think some of the things that I think will strike a chord for the people here today are three or four things that you mentioned, and then I'll just go straight to the questions we've asked. The whole element of gig, along with how important creativity is going to be in jobs, agility is going to be in jobs, and following passion. And I think if these are the positive sentiments that I think I take out, because while everyone is looking at the glum and job loss and whatever else, the fact that an environment or a, or a, or a global um, I wouldn't even call it an event because it's going to be a long drawn out one, um, actually can change the way you approach your work life in itself is something that I think is a very strong message for everyone to take away from here. So uh, just in terms of a rapid fire so that we can cover many questions there are about 172 questions, but I'm not going to go through them. And we've got exactly um, less than uh, 35 minutes to do that. The first question was really, MBAs, the relevance of MBA in today's uh, day and age as, a, as, as, you know, the pros and cons, the relevance of MBAs in one shot. Okay, that's wonderful. Now, I'm a chartered accountant by training, yeah? And I've earned my spurs working in a company like Unilever in different parts of the world. But I am a firm believer that MBA is still relevant. The kind of skills it gives, you know, at the end of the day, very often we think that we go in for a great grad school and that's the end of it. What a great grad school does is teaches you what to learn and how to learn. And that is what we need to pick up. You know, if you, I, I certainly don't allude to that without an MBA, you can't succeed. Of course you can succeed. But if you go to a good school, what will take you trial and error and many years to learn, you can pack it in two years. Yeah. So and I would... Now more and more universities are going to go online with their MBA. Absolutely. Program. Absolutely. I would certainly urge you. You know, I'm on the advisory board of Harvard Business School. I'm on the board of Indian School of Business. And I'm acutely conscious that each of these great schools have been investing a lot in becoming contemporary. Yeah. If you go to HBS, for instance, you're not going to learn case studies only about what happens in the U.S. Yes. Yeah, one third of the cases are from the developing part of the world. And I think yeah, that's last. Right. Yeah, that's last. Right. But otherwise, there's a lot of skepticism today that if I haven't got an offline degree, will my online degree be valued even by companies like yours? You know, my uh, now you might have a question in your mind, some of you that, uh, well, why does HUL then focus itself only a few certain schools? Why don't we go very wide enough? At the end of the day, resources are limited. Yeah, so you have to focus on a certain things to recruit your talent, and it's a filtration process. But even if you're a good student, and if it's not one of the top schools, but if you're sincere about learning, you could learn a lot and develop yourself. So don't so go another, just for the brand, go for just, learning. Sorry, I'm just going to go a little quickly. Uh, relevant in, in FMCG and overall as a sales job, I think the question is, uh, it's always about numbers and about push and sales. Uh, do you see a role where artificial intelligence, machine learning and creativity can come into the sales job? Massive. You know, the amount of investments we have done to bring in technology into the sales function and that's what I was alluding to when I was talking about it. Just think of it. A small grocery store, a humble grocer, yeah, in Alt Mount Road or on Pedder Road, and, a alt, and the same kind of grocer in a Dhaisar should have a completely different assortment. It should be based on the kind of consumers and shoppers which live in the vicinity, their purchasing power, their behaviors. And today, Machine learning and AI allows you to do that. Hmm. Yeah, as HUL, we cover millions of stores. But I have a very clear vision that in another couple of years, each of these million stores will have an assortment just made for them. That's and that is, where, that is where machine learning comes in. That's where AI comes in. Yeah. 
So there's an entire element of creative thinking. Otherwise, everyone looks at sales at a very different perspective. You know, I'll give you another thing. Uh, uh, my take on sales. Yeah, I worked in sales for three years, and that is when I saw how a product gets converted to cash. That is where the rubber hits the road. That is where you know if there is a two rupee difference on a case, the stock will flow from Mumbai to Delhi. Yeah, I would still urge everyone that if you get an opportunity, please do work in sales. It uh, hones your leadership skills, and it makes you understand the fundamentals of business. Okay, I'm going to move to. Um, if there were one or two change in consumer trends that you would think will happen in the post-COVID world, because the world is going to change, things are going to change. What do you think are the one or two things that as consumer behaviors will? You know, for the last uh, couple of months since it, the outbreak in China, we have been monitoring the trends, the behaviors very closely. Now it's going to manifest in many different ways. Yeah, first is of course that in the near term, there is going to be a change of behavior. People won't be going out. They won't be celebrating in big groups, pubs, restaurants, et cetera. Won't happen. So they'll be more about dining in. Yeah. But also, for instance, your habits, your hygiene habits, that's going to have a big shift. People will become much more conscious. Even when our country starts opening up, it is not going to be a scenario like before. For many months, there will be even government-imposed restrictions. Work your factory with half the number of people, for instance, or your offices with half the number of people. You can't have office canteens where people are sitting like what it used to be earlier. It will all be spaced out because this is not something which will get over very quickly. You will have to be on your toes for a pretty long period of time. So there will be definitely, and depending on the kind of economic crisis, the kind of recession that we will have, the kind of toll it will take on the country, it will also impact people's attitude towards spending. Yeah. Yeah, discretionary spends. And you're switching track. Take. Yeah. A couple of questions that I'm, and I'm summarizing some of them. Yeah. Uh, what is your advice to senior managers, people who have another 20 years left in their careers and in their working life? Yeah. What, what, and they're, they're not in the midlife crisis kind of yeah. situation. Yeah. And, what are your words of advice to them? You know, first is become a learner yourself. Yeah. And it's very important for each one of us, if we don't want to be fossilized, to invest in learning, to reinventing yourself. If we don't reinvent an organization, an organization, you know, uh, uh, the longevity goes away. Similarly, when I talk about the career, don't be worried about technology. Yeah, you need to have the passion, you need to have the enthusiasm and keep investing in yourself and keep developing yourself. You know, for many years, I have been going through reverse mentoring. I have sleek guys, tech savvy guys who help me. But at the same time, I invest significant amount of money and my resources in learning technology. That's the only way. Otherwise, we won't be able to lead. We won't be able to work because the impact is going to be across industries. I think um, you elucidated very well your day in a work for home environment. But I think as some of the questions that have come in is not all of us have the luxury of talking to Southeast Asia in the morning and London in the evening. Uh, but how as normal working professionals do we make work for home, which seems to be a long-term thing, more efficient with a little less distraction. Yeah. And especially since most of us live in slightly more small homes and enjoy Absolutely. that. Absolutely. You know, first is, like everything good in life, you need to have a certain discipline about it. So one of the things what we have done as a company is told people that the virtual meetings should be held only within a certain bracket. It's not that some bloke will get up at seven in the morning and say, I need to have my meeting. Other guy will say, I'm a late sleeper, so I'll have the meeting at 10.30 now. You know, bring about a discipline within. Because one has to understand that not everyone is going to have help at home. Yeah, so you will have to, you know, is uh, work on domestic chores, on cooking, cleaning, 
Yeah, your kids will be there. You have to look after them. So one has to bring about a certain discipline about it. And then there should be a certain cadence and rhythm. Yeah, what I have done is that all my, many of my meetings, which are regular in nature, are fixed at a certain time of the day. So everyone knows it and it all adds up. So what my board members do is, early in the morning, and my uh, South Asia country chairpersons do is, they have the meetings early in the morning, they get what is happening on the ground. So when we meet, it's a very focused discussions. Yeah, we always, we focus on a few areas now. Ronnie, we don't are, uh, go into a lot of area. First is the safety and health of our people. Yeah, second is we look at the supply lines. Third is we look at demand. How is the consumer behavior changing? What's happening to the demand? Fourth is we focus on liquidity and cash. And the fifth is we look at community. These are the five big areas that we focus on. Yeah. So everyone knows that this is going to be, and many of the things, nice to do, etc. drop it for the moment. These are not the moments to focus on them. So a very pointed question is, there is a concern, obviously, that everyone who's in a working profession, that organizations now will focus more and more on profitability versus compassion and yeah. will be more a rhetoric. Small organizations, medium organizations, different challenges. Yeah. Uh, your sort of view on over the next two years, is that going to, you know, everyone yeah. says employee first, shareholder next, customer. Yeah. First, yeah. That's yeah. Right. yeah. So, is, uh, so one has to really break up also depending on the size of the organization, the health of the organization. Yeah. Is if I look at small and medium enterprise, who do not have much resources at their disposal, for them, the most important thing is going to be focus on cash and liquidity. You don't want to go bankrupt. Yeah, so if you want to organize a line of credit, do it now. If you want to reduce your certain exposures, do it now. This is a moment for you to focus and ensure that you keep running your business and you have enough liquidity to do that. So that's foremost. Yeah. Now think of it, even a large enterprise where there's going to be supply constraints, there is going to be demand challenges. Again, your first and foremost job is to ensure the sustainability of your enterprise. If your enterprise does not survive, you won't be able to look after your people and your community. So first focus on that. What will you do to ensure the long-term health of the business? So that's very vital. And it's not business as usual. This is business unusual. Yeah. And, and so one has to also plan for a possibility that it could be an L kind of recession. Yeah. So plan for that. But also we have to remember that as a business, we are a part of society. We are not an appendage to a society. We are an integral part of the society. If the society and the country does not survive, our business won't survive. So, so connected to that, actually, Sanjeev, was another linked question, which is a lot of our people are from the IT sector and industry. And yeah. just your view on, you know, as the West slows down, will that bring enough pressure on the IT companies here? And we will see some serious slowdown on that. And what should working professionals do to really reinforce yeah. them? You know, I have a very different take on this. Mm -hmm. I believe that this could be another Y2K kind of opportunity for India. During this tough times, if Indian IT is able to ensure that the service they provide to the global customers goes uninterrupted and remains of a very high level, yeah, the credibility of Indian IT will move to a new level altogether. We have always been talking about these are the moments you get when you also move up the value chain. Yeah. So they should be part of the IT teams focusing on how do you upgrade to a higher order in the value chain. The other is to be absolutely relentless in ensuring flawless service. If we do that, the credibility of Indian IT would move to a new level altogether. I think this is a great moment for us. But also, there is an onus on the country to ensure that power supply doesn't get interrupted. Yeah, people are allowed to work. 
where they need to go to office, requisite passes should be issued. Because here you're not just talking about servicing the country. Indian IT serves the globe. And this is an asset test for us, but a massive opportunity. Yeah, no, I think that's very encouraging insight. Um, some of them want to just have your sort of headline insight on what the government would need to do to improve the economy and really... Ah, absolutely. You, you know, I'm also part of the presidium of FICI. So one has been also trying to work with the government a lot is not only to ensure that give inputs to how the supply lines keep running, but also very importantly, the government, what they need to do. Yeah. Now, I'll give you a few ideas what I believe the government ought to do, because it's something that they will have to necessarily do. Yeah. If I look at rural areas, there are a few things we will definitely have to do, because rural is going to get, even under more stress as the migrant workers come back, yeah, the alternate incomes that they have will dry up, and there will be more stress on already a scenario in rural India where the wage rates were very low. Yeah. So one is the direct transfer of money. And the other thing the government also has to see is those people who do not have Jandan accounts, how do you provide the money? The second is our FCI godowns have got about 70 million tons of food. Yeah. And what they normally require, I would believe, is about 20 to 25 million tons. Use this to ensure no one in India goes hungry. That's the second very important bit. Third is, if we can practice the discipline of social distancing, yeah, then the Manrega should be reactivated to keep the people gainfully engaged in rural India. Fourth and very important, we are getting into the harvest season. Yeah? And this is a time when, whether it's a harvester, when it is the workers, whether it is the supply lines to the mandis and the cities, that should not get interrupted. So that's very important for the government to ensure as rural India. As far as urban India is concerned, we have to protect our small and micro enterprises. Yeah, Whether it is differing their loans or uh, the government absorbing the interest rates, there could be different ways of doing it but important that you provide the funds so that there is enough liquidity in the system. And even during stressful times, when the demand goes down, our enterprises are able to survive. Because livelihoods are linked to it. And India is a country where 90% of the people are in the so-called informal sector. Mm. Yeah? So we have to ensure whether it is extending the mudra schemes. Similarly for large enterprises, one, the government would have to come up with a scheme which allows them to function, which has enough liquidity in the system. They don't go bankrupt and the wheels of the economy start functioning again. On the other hand, as far as the demand is concerned, there are various ways they could be doing it. One is they could underwrite the wages so that people do not separate the workers. Yeah, Or they could have direct transfer of subsidy so that People do get earnings, even in case they do not have the small business running or they are laid off. So it will have to be worked on both the demand side and the supply side. At the same time, RBI will have to ensure that the health of the financial institutions, yeah, it remains strong enough for them to bear this lot. Now look at US. Unfortunately, we do not have, do not have the deep pockets of US, but they have... They're talking about $2, billion, $2 trillion. $2 trillion is two-third the GDP of India. And within this $2 trillion, they're talking about $450 billion going to the Fed. No, no, going to the Fed, which will have a multiplier effect of 10x. So you are talking about several measures being taken. And then when you have a war kind of scenario, then you should not worry about the deficit. Yeah. The deficit, we'll have to park it by the side. We have to first ensure that the economy doesn't stall. People have the livelihoods. They have food to eat. And then even if, for instance, the rating comes down, yeah, if the economy picks up, it will again go back. A long-term, mid to long-term attractiveness of India is not going away. We well, have to manage. Have a 
very positive framework and I'm glad we got you on here because at least I think you're, you're very objectively laying out for a lot of people here with so many concerns of the grass is and could be greener on the other side and I think there is a lot of hope. I'm going to go with three last questions here to move this, um, more or less in around jobs, but your, se your sense of what are the one or two sectors over the next six to 12 months that will really shine? Where should we look at those sectors? We're betting on yeah. tech as you, 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 you know, first is take healthcare. Yeah. Yeah. This is a fabulous opportunity for India to build a healthcare infrastructure. You know, we are talking about 0.5 beds per thousand. And this is where the resources of the country, resources of corporation should be deployed that not only we expand, but very importantly, build the capabilities of the healthcare. Interest. Interest. Absolutely. Absolutely. India, because of our low wages, we could really become the medical capital of the world. Just like during the Y2K crisis, it gave a fillip to IT. Can we use COVID-19 to give a fillip to healthcare? Yeah, this could become a big employer and it could attract massive foreign exchange. And this could really also help the country tremendously. So for me, healthcare, absolutely important. Interesting. I'm betting on ed tech, but healthcare is also an important. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, second last question really is, estimates vary at about 20 million job losses over the next six months. Depressing as it may sound, any short or um, you, you know you know right at the beginning of my chat i said let's not put a figure to it because no one can today let me tell you no one is in a position with a fair degree of accuracy to predict what is going to be the impact yeah the only thing we could do by predicting is give credibility to astrology hmm. yeah so let's not worry about that. More important is that we should, as a country, these are times where we should not have political differences. Yeah, we should come together as a nation, yeah, join hands with the government. We have a dis you may have different political affiliation, but you have a decisive government. Help the government to control this, to contain this. And that's what we need to do as individuals, as organizations. And in whatever way we can, follow the instructions, help the communities, and that in, in many ways will set the tone for even the businesses to step up and ensure that they don't shed workers. Yeah, As a company, we have very clear, as Unilever globally, we have taken a call that for the next three months, people in our ecosystem, not directly employed by us necessarily, but in the ecosystem, we will ensure that their jobs are protected. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that's the kind of nationalistic Na feeling should come in. I think that is it. But the nationalistic feeling where everyone has to step up that this is no longer just my problem. Absolutely. Out of that. And I think uh, even for, for people who are in working professionals, whether they might take a pay cut or why, or whatever else, this is the right time to look at the right sizing, but look at this as an overall problem and not my problem. I think if that tonality can change in the country. We have a lot, a lot to gain from even some of the Western countries in the world. Yeah, Ronnie, we were very young, you know, when the 71 war happened, the last war. You know, if you keep aside Kargil, Kargil was a limited. And I still remember the kind of nationalistic fervor that used to come in. Yeah. 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 We need to bring in a similar kind of fervor in the country, you know, helping yeah. your neighbor, helping your community, putting nation first. And if you all come together, I think India will come out much stronger. Just look at it from another lens. Uh, most of the companies who were dependent on China for their supply chain are definitely not going to put all eggs in one basket. Absolutely. That's going to change. That world order is changing. That world order will change. And could India be the beneficiary? Mm -hmm. If India is able to survive, our stature amongst the committee of nations will go up. Our economy will gain strength, and China's loss could very well be India's gain if we play things well. Yeah. And just the last question, also to end on a positive note, though I think you've spent a fair amount of positivity, is you have such a global perspective, 
And do you believe that the present thing, uh, developments that are happening in China, where they're actually coming back to work, do you think that's a ray of hope for us to look at it? Or you think they can set themselves back? You, you, you know, from whatever I know about even a China business, you, you know, we have a big operation that's Unilever in China. The business has bounced back. Yeah, has people are going, yeah. Business has bounced back to near normalcy. So and, you know, that's a good trend to pick up, that if you can have a very focused level of containment, things could improve. Absolutely. And that is the reason why when the government says, guys, stay at home, please stay at home. Yeah. Because our healthcare system is not equipped to, if this were to really become a pandemic, our healthcare system is not equipped to take care of the kind of load that will happen. Yeah. But if we can, I know it is painful, but if we can survive this, if we can bend the curve and reduce the number of incidents and spread it out over a longer period, then India will be able to survive and India yeah. will be able to do well. Sanjeev, thank you so much. I think that's a lot of positive messaging. I think today's young working professionals everywhere just need many of us to spread that word. Thank you for giving a very wide perspective also. Really appreciate it. And thank you for being with us today. Rapha. Thank you, Ronnie. It's a real pleasure. My last message to everyone on the call, guys, look after yourself. Stay safe. Look after your parents. Look after your neighbors. And India will come out strong. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Take care. Bye.